Well, good morning, men. It's great to be here with you. It's always a privilege to, to get a chance to, to stand in uh, for Pat and appreciate the opportunity to share with you today. We're going to get started today with uh, get our blood flowing a little bit by uh, talking about friends. And we're going to talk about what it looks like to have real friendships from a biblical perspective and how that contrasts with what's going on in the world. You know, a bobblehead gospel says, hey, why, why have friends when acquaintances are so much less trouble? And, you know, our world is kind of uh, built for that idea of helping us have acquaintances, helping us have people who help us have the kind of life that we want to have. And yet there's a distinction between that and what the Bible would talk about in terms of real friendship. And so that's what we're going to be exploring this morning. But before we do, we want to start with a, a friendly contest. We want to get our heart beating a little bit. So I need a couple of volunteers who, who will help me out here. Promise is not embarrassing. Who will help me out? Somebody raise your hand quick. Okay. I've got one. You stay right there. You stay right there. Okay. And then, all right, you're going to help me. All right. This is what I want you to do. All right. You're, it's going to be a trivia contest. Okay. So you read the questions. Uh, when I put them up on the screen, come up with your answers on a sheet of paper. Okay. No one say anything out loud. No one talk, any of that kind of stuff. All right. Individual effort. Now, you guys, okay, don't tell him, but you're working as a table, okay? okay? The whole table is working together, okay. all right? Don't tell him what you're doing. Whisper, okay? Here we go. All right. You ready? You're only going to have a few seconds for each one, all right? Somebody write it down there. What is the capital of Montana? It's the first question, Okay. What is the capital of Montana? Next, what baseball great's nickname is synonymous with a large sailing ship? Okay. What fish has a suction cup on top? Y'all aren't even talking to each other. You're supposed to be talking to write these things down. You're going to ruin my illustration here, okay? Maybe another table you start. Maybe you'll do better than them, okay? What fish has a suction cup on top that allows it to stick to other fish? It rhymes with a brand that you used to put in your coffee. Richard Nixon's running mate in 1972. Okay. Everybody be quiet now. Winners of the World Cup in 2006. Nice. Nice. Famous Green Bay quarterback whose first name begins with B, four letters. How many acres in a square mile? And what is the sixth planet from the sun? Okay, do you need to see any of the questions again? This was the first page. And this is the second page. Okay, do you have your answers? All right, you got them? You got them? All right, here we go. You ready? Here's the answers. What is the capital of Montana? Helena. Baseball great, the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio. A fish, the Remora. Richard Nixon's running mate, Spiro Agnew. Okay. Winners of the World Cup in 2006, Italy. Famous Green Bay quarterback, not Brett Favre, that has five letters, Bart Starr. How many acres in a square mile, 640, and six planet from the sun, Saturn? Okay, how many did you get right, Chris? Two. Two. How many did you guys get right? Six. Six. Thank you for saving my illustration. Okay. <laughs> I was getting a little worried there. These guys are like using mental telepathy to communicate or something. There's no words being transferred at all, you know. I guess they were like writing them on a piece of paper. That was great. So six to two. Now, what's the point? The point is, one man by himself is not going to be able to do as well as men who are working together. Very simple illustration, very simple point, but it applies in our lives as well as it applies in a trivia contest. Uh, We need friends. We need men who are on our side. We need guys that are on our team if we're going to become everything that God wants us to be. So let's look together at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verses 9 through 21. 
And I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. May God add understanding to the reading of his holy word. You know, it's interesting when we think about friendships in our culture today, Uh, It's a big issue with men. There's actually been a lot of studies that have been done recently in the last 10, 20 years about men and friendships, and there's lots of books that have been written about it, and you hear about it in our culture. You have the phrases like bromance and all these kinds of things that are out there now. Um, And so what is going on with men and friendships? Well, it's interesting because uh, one of the things that, that we find is that it's hard to have real friends in our culture today. It's hard to have real friends. As a matter of fact, one of the men that I've spoken to about this was telling me about uh, his journey in life, and he just basically said, I've given up ever finding a real friend. I just don't think it's ever going to happen for me. And my suspicion is that there's probably some guys in this room like that, that you see other men that have sort of this brotherly relationship with some guys. Maybe they do things together. They talk about what's going on. You hear about the trips they've been on or the adventures they've done or whatever. And, and probably a little bit of jealousy because maybe you don't have somebody like that, that you feel that kind of connection to in your life. And uh, I know that I feel that way many times when I hear about some of these relationships because it's hard to have those kinds of friendships, especially and make them last. If you look at our our lifestyle today, it's almost engineered against us having real friends. I mean, the odds are stacked against you. Think about the way we have structured our lives. You know, we live in little neighborhoods, right? Right. And we drive there in these cars, which means we can drive 10, 20, 30, 40 miles to work. And we can drive 10, 20 miles to church. And we can drive 10, 20, 30 miles for our hobbies and five miles for our shopping and and all these kinds of things. So what ends up happening is that we live typically with one group of people as neighbors and, and people in our neighborhood. And then we go to church with another group of people. Uh, then we work with a completely different set of people. We pursue our hobbies with another set of people. We have uh, shopping or or the necessities of life with a completely different set of people. And so I contrast this with 150 years ago. 150 years ago, if you lived in a small town somewhere, your neighbors would have been the people that you talked to. They would have been the people you shopped with. They would have been the people you worked with, you went to church with. Uh, you would have interacted with those people naturally a tremendous amount of time. In today's world, I, ha- I for example, I have a group of uh, a couples that I meet with on a weekly basis, my wife and I. And I can almost guarantee you that I will not see any of those couples during the rest of the week in any of my normal activities. As a matter of fact, I never have. I've never seen any of them at my office. I've never seen any of them in my neighborhood. I've never seen any of them at a store. I've never seen any of them, you know, riding my bike. Um, You know, I'm just never going to see them. Even at church with two services, I may not see them. Right? And we're part of this. I mean, there's a church group that we're meeting with. And so our culture is, and most of you guys in this room, you may feel the same way about the group that you're with here. You may not see these guys naturally in any other part of your life except for Friday morning. 
And so the odds are stacked against us just in terms of the time that we can actually spend together. And then our affluence, our relative affluence, even in this economic recession, our relative affluence uh, is a strike against us because there's so many options for us. There's television, there's, you know, there's Internet, there's video games, there's all kinds of hobbies we can pursue, uh, all kinds of trips we can take, and all these things that we can use our time and spend our time on other than investing in relationships. And then the pace of life that comes from that with our kids, with our jobs, involvement in all the different spheres that we're, that we're in. You know, sometimes I know with young kids, I, I would feel guilty with the idea of just going out and doing something, like going to play pool with some guys or something. I'd be like, I can't do that. I mean, I've got these little kids at home. My wife's been there. She's got to take care of them. I, you know, I, there's too much to do to take the time to do something like that. And so that's one of the things that, that we have to struggle with is this pace of life. And then I think as men, we are also unwilling to let our guards down. There's a lot of pride in manhood today in America. You know, we don't want to, to let anybody get to know us too much because they may not like what they see or we may let them down or we may fail. If I keep you at arm's distance, I don't have to worry about that because you're not really going to get to know what's going on inside. And then it takes energy to have relationships, right? I mean, they're messy. I mean, if you have a real friend, he may call you at uh, 11 o'clock at night and tell you his car's broken down and you may have to get up and get some clothes on and go pick him up, right? Who wants to do that? And so it's easier sometimes just to keep people at arm's length. It was interesting when I was doing some research for this uh, message, reading some of the anecdotes, one of the gentlemen that had done a sociological study talked about one of the members of that study giving the example of a group of men that he's friends with went for a fishing trip for a week in Canada. And uh, his wife knew that one of the uh, men, his daughter, was about to get married, knew that another man was facing some uh, issues in their relationship, knew that another man, his mother-in-law, had uh, cancer and was, had recently had surgery. And so when he got back from this week-long fishing trip, uh, his wife said, well, honey, how, did you hear about such and such? Did you hear about so and so? Did you hear about... It never came up. You know, never came up. And she made the observation, you know, I think women talk more in a public restroom than men would do on this week-long fishing trip that they're on, you know. Um, another time, a guy, said, uh, a guy said, I've been playing poker with the same group of men every Thursday night for 18 years. So I decided to ask one of them. I said, uh, hey, uh, Tom, could you name my kids? He thought about it for a second. He said, well, I could rename them for you if you need me to. <laughs> But it's true, right? It's true. As men, it's easy for us to not really get into those kinds of relational details where we're really connecting. And yet the Bible assumes that we're not going to go it alone. The Bible assumes that we're going to be in relationships. For example, in Paul's letters, Romans is one of Paul's letters, this section that we read, there are 18, 817 instances where the you pronoun is used, Y-O-U. And in English, we, of course, use the same word, you, for individuals as you, plural. There's no distinction in English between those two words. However, in Greek, there is a distinction. And so in, in the Greek, 709 of the 817 times that Paul uses the word you, it's plural. In other words, when he is saying things to you, he is saying them to you all. He is implying or expecting that you are going to be in this thing together, that you're not going to be out there on your own trying to make it in your own strength. And so let's look at this uh, characteristics of friendships that we see here in Romans chapter 12, because I think it helps us think about uh, where we are. One of the things that we see is that a friend is other focused, other focused several places in this passage. It talks about having genuine affection taking delight in honoring each other, uh, being ready to help each other. You know, just being aware of the other person more than ourselves and seeing them and understanding the needs that they might have. Another thing is that we should be compassionate. And man, I tell you what, I have, a, I have so much trouble with this in my life. I don't know about some of you guys, but just being compassionate. In this scripture, it talks about practicing hospitality, being happy with those who are happy and weeping with those who weep. And I find I don't necessarily lack compassion because I'm hard hearted. I lack compassion, I think, because it takes an effort 
for me to be compassionate. I mean, I have to really think about what you're saying. I have to really put myself in your shoes. I have to hear you. I have to understand how hard it is. And frankly, I've got my own stuff. I'm busy. I've got a lot of things going on. You know, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm with those pastors who say their school of counseling is the, the get over it school of counseling. You know, uh, that's kind of more my style. But the scriptures say we need to be compassionate. We need to be compassionate. It takes energy and effort to do that. And then I think we also have to be aware of the battle that's involved in friendship. You know, this is not just some kind of an optional thing that, um, that we uh, can do if we want to. The scriptures assume that we are going to be in relationship. And, uh, you know, if you're alone, you're at risk. You've probably seen some of those nature documentaries when the cheetahs or the leopards or the lions come out and the herds out there. And what do they do? What's the first thing that they do when they go after that herd of, of, of animals? They separate one, right? They find one, usually the weakest, the youngest, the oldest, whatever. Separate it from the rest of the herd. That's the first thing that they do. And that is the first thing that our enemy wants to do to you. He wants to separate you from the herd. It's a real battle that we're involved in. If you're alone, you are at risk. I was, uh, got an email from a guy this week who told me, uh, hey, David, uh, I, don't, I don't really want to have a phone call with you right now because, frankly, I'm not doing well. Now, my response was, that's exactly a great, that's a great reason for us to have a phone call. But he is, I know from a fact, had dinner with him earlier this year. He's isolated himself. You know, he's not in church. He's not in a group. He dropped all that about a year ago. And now he's reaping the fruit of, of being isolated, of being separated from the herd. There's a battle that we need to be aware of. In this, in this scripture passage, it talks about hating what's wrong. It talks about there are going to be people who persecute you. There are going to be enemies, it says in this passage. And there's no middle ground in this battle. There's no negotiated settlement. We can't just cruise through life with a white flag, uh, some kind of armistice. It's a battle to the death. And we're either going to win this battle or we're going to lose this battle. There's no middle ground. And we have to be aware of that in terms of the importance, understand the importance of friendship. And then finally, I think it shows, this passage shows that our friendship should be goal-oriented. We're supposed to overcome evil with good. We're supposed to honor people. We're supposed to glorify God. We're supposed to seek to be a blessing. And so there's this idea here that transformation is involved in our relationships, that God has a a goal for us in our friendships that we should be seeking to to live out in uh, our relationships with other people. And so Paul is describing here a state where we want to give ourselves to others the way Jesus gave himself to us. I mean, that's really what we're talking about when we talk about friendships, wanting to give ourselves to others the way that Jesus gave himself to us. But too many times we don't live like this. I know I don't. I have my own agenda. I have my own thoughts. I have my own schedule. I have my own problems and all those things to deal with. And yet, if I do that, I'm really going to be stunted. You know, I have to ask the question sometimes when I interact with other people, am I really interacting with them? Sort of a pure, unadulterated Uh, understanding and confrontation with exactly who they are? Or am I filtering that through all of my issues and problems and schedule and agenda and, you know, things I need to get done? And, And so they're coming in, but it's like this dim sort of through this foggy window. I don't really experience them because what I'm really seeing is all my stuff. Okay. Now I need another volunteer who'll help me out. Who who can help me out this morning? All right. Step up here. Very simple. It's very simple what I want you to do. I want you to stand right here. Okay? And I want you to take... You can face me and that'd be good. All right. Take two steps forward and I'm going to toss you this ball and you catch it. Perfect. Okay? Did you see that? All right. Now we're going to do the same thing again. That's it. Yeah, he deserves a round of applause. Okay, stand right there. We're going to do the same thing again. But this time, I want you to hold this mirror right in front of your face. Okay? All right. Take two steps forward and catch the ball. Okay. Now, thank you very much. Appreciate your help. Now, what happened? You're not going to be able to catch the ball if you got a mirror in front of your face, right? And if you're sitting there staring at yourself, you're not going to be aware of what's going on around you. 
And you know, when I think about the way I relate to people so often, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm practiced enough and polished enough that they may not be aware of it. But in reality, what's going on is I'm sitting there with a mirror in front of my face. Because I'm really more focused on myself and my issues and my stuff than I am really hearing them, listening to them, understanding them, being a friend to them. And if we live like this, we're not going to really be able to be the friend that God wants us to be. So somehow we have to get beyond a focus on ourselves. And we do that when we truly experience the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you're here today and you are absolutely certain that Jesus Christ is your friend. And that he has got your back and that he is going to take care of you. Then that frees you then to put down the mirror. You don't have to worry about yourself anymore. Now you can really love another person. And so here's a little uh, here's a little idea for us, a prayer that you could pray when you interact with people. I'd love for you to try this today. I'm, I'm trying this after preparing this message. Here it is. God, what does he need that I can help him find? You get a phone call. Hello? Under your breath or in, the, in your mind. God, what does this person need that I can help him find? And they start to talk. And all of a sudden, you're in a completely different place. Right? No, no, the mirror is gone, and you're ready to listen to them and see them for who they are. God, what does he need that I can help him find? Let that be a prayer that we pray as we interact with people. You know, it's so powerful when you begin to care for people what happens. There's a man in our community that um, is an acquaintance, a friend, and uh, he has what he calls, some of you probably know him, he has what he calls the ministry of availability. Uh, he schedules his business life so that he can meet with guys pretty much any time, anywhere they want to get together. And uh, I met with him earlier this summer and uh, had a chance to have breakfast and talk with him a little bit. And he said, I, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it was, I know it was over 50. It may have been over 70 uh, men that he's met with so far this year. Different men. Simply because, and he doesn't advertise or he's not, you know, some kind of professional ministry, whatever. He just simply lets guys know, if you want to get together, I'll get together anytime, anywhere that you want to get together and talk. And God uses that in a powerful way because the, the person knows that this man cares about me. And that's the kind of friendships that we need to, we need to have. That's the kind of mentality that we need to present to others. You see, it's, it's really linked in with the very heart of the gospel. Faith in Christ is ultimately has to show itself in love for other people. You know, it says that, that loving God and loving your neighbor go hand in hand, and that fulfills the law of Christ. And so when the gospel restores us, when Jesus Christ, by his grace, forgives us of our sins gives us a new life, transforms our heart, then what happens is now we are restored in a relationship with him and we are given the ability to really love other people, not to manipulate them, not to use them, but to really sacrificially love them. And so when Jesus gives us a bigger vision, we're going to be compelled to invest our life in other people. So what are some of the things that this might look like? Well, uh, we need to be investing in long-term friends. And one of the uh, most important ways we can do this is to pray for them. I hope you have some other men that you pray for every day. I'm challenging myself with this. I want to pray for some other men every day. And I want to hopefully know that some other men are praying for me every day. Because we need that. This is a real battle. We need to pray Another one that we need to do is we need to communicate. We need to make the effort to find out how they're doing. We need to make the effort to listen because this is an investment that we're making in their life. We need to spend the time it takes. Uh, it, it, if we need to figure out how to get together. We need to make it a discipline. I know I, sometimes I'll go home and I'll talk to Ruthie and I'm like, oh, it'd be fun to get together with Jay tonight, you know. And she's like, oh, well, why don't you call him and y'all can go, you know, do something. I'm like, well, yeah, but then I'm going to have to get on the phone and I'm going to have to call him and he may not be able to go. And then I'll have to get in the car and I'll have to drive somewhere and, you know, don't have to drive home. And, you know, I mean, if I could snap my fingers and we were like magically at the pool hall or whatever, you know, that'd be one thing. But all that work at the end of a day, you got to be kidding me, you know, right? 
I mean, it's a little over-exaggeration, but seriously, it takes, it takes effort, if, but we need to have that discipline because it's, it's not really optional. It's not something we can forego. We have to invest in having real friendships. And finally, to seek their good, to bless them, to have a goal of thinking about how can I be used by God in this person's life? You see, it's not just what do I get from this friendship? Oh, I think they're, you know, they're fun to be around or they make me laugh or, you know, we get to do such fun things or cool stuff or whatever. Uh, They're interesting. You know, it's not just that. It's how can I be used in this person's life? What does God want to use me to do for this person so that they can become everything that God wants them to be. You know, our friendships are really a measure of um, our spiritual life. And one of the things that we ought to think about is, are we really making a difference in the lives of other people? Is it going to matter that we've been here? Are there a few guys that, whose lives are going to be changed because you walk the earth? Does anybody know who this is? Floyd Little. Floyd Little. Denver Broncos. If you've gotten a New Sports Illustrated magazine, there is an uh, amazing article in there about friendship. Floyd Little uh, retired from professional football in 1975. Uh, at the time he retired, he was the seventh leading all-time rusher. He was the only man who ever led the league in rushing for a last-place team. Um, he did all of these feats and exploits where, uh, and with an offensive line that only had three representatives in an all-star game for his entire career, okay? So he did this uh, by himself, basically. But he was not put into the Hall of Fame. And so there was a gentleman named Tom Mackey, and uh, Tom was a lifelong fan of the Broncos. Kind of funny how it happened. He was on a school bus one day, and his friend that he looked up to liked the Dallas Cowboys, and so he said, I'm going to like the Dallas Cowboys too. And his friend said, you can't do that. You have to pick a different team. I like the Cowboys. And so he looked at his little stickers on his NFL thing, and he saw this horse. He said, I guess I'll like them. And that was the Denver Broncos. Lifelong fan of Floyd Little, lifelong fan of the Broncos. In 2003, for his 40th birthday, his wife flew him out to meet Floyd Little. And over lunch, they began talking about his career, and and Tom Mackey was talking about all the statistics and all the things that Floyd had done and how he couldn't believe that he wasn't in the Hall of Fame and all this kind of stuff. And, of course, Floyd Floyd Little at this point is, I don't know, 55, 60 years old and probably a little wondering about this guy's sanity here. But uh, anyway, they developed a friendship, and Tom Mackey started on a crusade to get Floyd Little into the Hall of Fame. Every year there are two, uh, I forget what they call it, but retired uh, senior players that they uh, uh, select to be considered for voting into the Hall of Fame. And so uh, he began this crusade. He, He developed 44 reasons why Floyd Little should be in the Hall of Fame. He started mailing it out to everybody. He wrote a book. He sent it to journalists. He sent it to voters. He did everything he could do. Every year the the voting would come, and Floyd Little was not one of those two. Every year. Time after time after time. Finally, last year, Floyd Little was one of the two. And in February of 2010, he was voted in to the Hall of Fame. This guy had given seven years of his life, uh, spare time, you know, everything that he was. He was in advertising and he was an aspiring writer. So he gave seven years of his life to see that Floyd Little would be in the Hall of Fame. And those guys have now become fast friends. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have that kind of dedication to somebody or that we try to get them into some kind of awards or ceremonies or whatever. But there's something heroic about the kind of dedication to someone else that would help them achieve something like that. And guys, we need that in our friendships. We need to be the kind of men who help our friends become everything God wants them to be. You've got a friend right now whose marriage is probably not everything that it should, it should be. What could you do? How could you pray for them? How could you encourage them? How could you help them move that back onto the right path? You've got a man whose career is stuck, or maybe he's out of work, or finances are in a mess, or whatever. How could you help? How could you be a blessing? How could you change the direction of that man's life? You've got a friend whose children or grandchildren are struggling. How can you step into that situation? How could you pray? How could you create a new environment? How could you give some different opportunities to them? And it may take time, guys. It may take money. It may take sacrifice. 
But at the end of the day, if we make an investment in a friend that helps them become everything God wants them to be, it's going to be worth it because it will bring glory to God. (laughs) What long-term friend do you need to encourage today? Your action as you leave out. One is to pray when you interact with people. What does this person need that I can give them? The second thing is what is a long term, what is an investment you can make in a long term friend today? Do they need some encouragement? Do they need prayer? Do they need a note, a phone call, an email, a night out with their spouse, um, a weekend away, a job lead? What is something you can do today as you leave uh, this place to invest in your friendships for the glory of God? If we are half-hearted friends, it's because we are experiencing a half-hearted gospel. With Jesus as my friend, I can be a real friend. Guys, make Jesus your friend today and then be a friend to those men that he's placed in your life so that you can make a difference And that God can receive the glory. This is a battle. It's a battle that we can't afford to lose. But if we'll get together with some men, by God's grace, it's a battle that we can win. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful uh, for your word this morning. And we're thankful for how it speaks to us and how it challenges us as men. It's so easy in our culture to be the Lone Ranger, to just kind of... Uh, get by. Uh, we have a, a, many of us have what we need. We have the, enough money to eat. We have places, place to live. We have a car. You know, we have things to do. So we don't feel like, hey, I don't really need friends. And yet, Lord, your word tells us that there's a battle that's so much deeper than any of those surface things. And it's a battle that we cannot afford to lose. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd bring conviction into each one of our lives about the importance of friendship, that we would treasure the men that you place in our lives, that we would not um, easily uh, turn away from those relationships, turn away from those friendships, that, but that, Lord, that we would be uh, committed and loyal and uh, that we would be sacrificial, other-focused, that you'd help us to be men who really do make a difference, Lord. There are so many guys in this community today that are lonely, so many guys that feel like nobody really cares about them. Lord, I pray that you'd make us compassionate men who understand that we have been loved by you, first of all, that you've given us your grace, that you've saved us, that you've changed us, that you've transformed us. And Lord, as we experience that, as we as we know that you're our friend, Lord, make us great friends to the men that you bring into our lives. For your glory, we pray in Jesus name. Amen.